Good morning friends, I am Srishti and I am back with another set of 5 finance questions for you. I hope that you are liking the session that I am taking related to finance and it is proving to be really beneficial for you. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, then do subscribe to it for regular updates. Now, starting with the first question for today without wasting any time. The question says temporary control of inflation can be affected by which of the following? So four options have been given to you and you have to tell me that out of these four options, which of the option can control the inflation? That is, if inflation is high in the economy, then by implementing which of the following options a government could control the inflation. So let's look at it one by one. Firstly, we shall be discussing the purchasing of securities by RBI. So imagine RBI is the central bank and if it purchases the securities from the market, then securities will come to RBI and in return it has to give money in the economy. So this action of RBI will perhaps increase the money supply in the economy, boosting the inflation. So this option is not the correct one. The second is reduction in CRR. Now as you all know that what CRR is, a bank has to maintain some portion of its deposits with RBI. So if RBI reduces CRR, which directly means that now banks will be having more money to lend. So if more money to lend is there, that also means that people will start borrowing more as banks will lend more and therefore money supply in the economy will again increase in this case, which in turn will increase the inflation. This is also not the correct answer because in the given question, we have to find a solution wherein we can control the inflation. Now we shall be discussing these two options in the next slide. That is lowering benchmark rate and increase in the benchmark rate. Now you must know the relationship between the interest rates and the inflation. So just to brush it up, let's have a quick insight into this topic as well. There is an inverse relationship between interest rates and inflation. And how does it work? When the interest rates are reduced, that means that loans are now more cheaper and therefore it induces people to borrow more and spend. So this will increase the money supply. And as a result, as we already know that if money supply is increased in the economy, then inflation will also rise. So by reducing the interest rates, inflation goes up. So in the question that I have asked to you, if we have to control the inflation, then what RBI can do? RBI will increase its interest rate. So let's look at the option now. So here increase in the benchmark rate is the correct answer because this will increase the cost of borrowing and then people will reduce their borrowing habits and therefore money supply will reduce in the economy in the shorter term and therefore inflation will be controlled. So option D is the correct answer here. Now let's move on to the next question for today. The question is a task force has been set up by the RBI to look into ways to develop the secondary market for corporate loans. So that is under the chairmanship of. So recently uh, there was a news that RBI has set up a task force just in order to develop the secondary market for corporate loans. So this is a really straightforward question that under whose chairmanship this task force has been set up. So let me tell you the answer first and then we shall be discussing some of the suggestions made by this task force. So the answer is chairman of Canara Bank TN Manoharan. So option A is the correct answer. Now let's look at some of the suggestions made by this task force. So what is the current scenario here? FPIs are only allowed to invest in stressed assets through security receipts issued by ARCs or directly invest in NCDs or bonds issued by the borrowers. So let's quickly see that how this ARC works. We know that banks give loans to people and if they default in making the repayments or the interest payments, then after 90 days, they are classified as NPAs. 
now npas gave a lot of trouble to banks in the way that banks could not sell the pledged asset to recover their money without the court orders so in 2002 surfaci act as you all must be knowing that was introduced where the banks were authorized to recover the money by selling the pledged asset without any court order and arc is a financial institution that buys the npas or the bad assets from the banks and financial institutions so that the banks can clean up their balance sheets so you all must be thinking that as arcs buy the npas then how are they profiting how is it beneficial to them now these arcs what they do is they purchase npa as i have already told you they usually purchase those npas at a discounted price for example a npa of 1 crore rupees they may buy it at 70 to 90 lakh rupees and this purchase is funded by the issue of securities to qualified buyers and that is also known as security receipts now these arcs now recover the money from the borrower and the difference between the recovered amount and the amount paid to the bank for purchasing the npa less the repayment of money to the institutional lenders that is the profit for arcs so now you are getting it how this mechanism is beneficial for arcs so in the current scenarios only fpis are allowed to invest in stressed assets through the security receipts but the task force headed under the chairmanship of tn manoharan it suggested to develop a secondary market for corporate loans that is now fpi should be allowed to directly purchase the distressed loans from the banks or nbfcs within an annual prudential limit which will be defined by rpi in consultation of government of india so what will be the implication of this the implication will be that there will now be a active secondary market for corporate loans which will make the bank's balance sheets cleaner at a faster pace and also it will allow nbfcs to get rid of the liquidity crunch for more details on the suggestions part you can refer to the september current affairs document which is available on the website i have made a detailed document on this topic so you may refer to that topic for more information now moving on to the next question for today the question says which of the following is true for net income approach now you all must have read the capital structure theories wherein you must have read net income approach net operating income approach traditional approach so this net income approach is suggested by duran and you must remember this name as well now first let's discuss that what net income approach is in order to answer to this question you must remember that net income approach says that capital structure matters now let's first discuss the assumptions given by the net income approach it says that kd that is cost of debt is less than cost of equity also known as ke and kd and ke remains constant as you can see in this diagram ke and kd remains constant and kd is always less than ke now it also says that there is increase in financial leverage now what is it that is use of more and more debt financing in the capital structure that does not affect the risk perception of the investors now in the previous finance video i have talked about trading on equity and the risk of using more debt but this net income approach suggests that there is no change or no effect on the risk perception of the equity investors if we choose more debt in our capital structure but here as in the assumption it is said kd and ke are constant now we know that by using more of kd that is a cheaper debt in the overall capital structure that will result in the magnified returns available to the shareholders and the increased returns to the shareholders will increase the total value of the firm as total value of the firm will increase the cost of the overall firm will decrease as you can see here now ko will approach 
KD as the debt proportion is increased. However, this KO will never touch KD. And what is the reason behind it? That a firm cannot be a 100% debt firm and that is the reason KO can never meet KD. So if we want to conclude this approach, then we can say that higher the degree of leverage, better it is as the value of the firm would be higher. In other words, a firm can increase its value just by increasing the debt proportion in the capital structure. I hope that you have understood this net income approach. If you want me to make you understand net operating income approach, traditional approach or MM model, then you must mention it in the comment section. And in the next finance current video, I shall be including one question from these topics as well. Now moving back to the question, as we have concluded that this net income approach says that financial leverage is good. That is higher debt is better because it will increase the total value of the firm. So option B is the correct answer. Now moving on to the next question for today, which of the following statement is incorrect regarding central registry of securitization asset reconstruction and security interest of India. A really heavy name. So let's abbreviate this. That is SIRSAI. So four statements have been given to you and you have to tell me that which one is incorrect. So before reading on to the statements, let's have a brief discussion on what this actually means and how it is benefiting to people. Let's try to understand that why SIRSAI came into force. Now in India, before the formation of SIRSAI, information on the encumbrance on a property that was known only to the borrower and lender due to the fragmented registration system. And as a result, people could obtain multiple loans on the same property. Now suppose A is a borrower and he has a property so he goes to a bank and he gives the papers of this property and obtain the loan on this. Now this transaction is known only to the bank and to the borrower. Now what A do is A again goes to another bank and he claims that he has lost the originals. So he takes the loan from the bank using the attested copies of the deed. And again on the same property, he could have another loan. So this property, one single property is used by A to obtain multiple loans, which is ethically wrong because one single property should be used to obtain one loan. So that is earlier there was a fragmented registration system that is only the borrower and the bank giving the loan were aware of this transaction. So then SIRSAI came and its initial mandate was to maintain a central registry of the equitable mortgages where it contains information on the equitable mortgage taken on a property along with details of the financial institution as well as details about the borrower. It also allowed lenders, that is banks, to register transactions of securitization and asset reconstruction. So it is basically a registry platform and it can be accessed online by financial institutions and general public for a fee. So this allows prospective lenders, that is this bank, now it can check that whether A has been taking a loan on the same property earlier or not. And even if A has used this property earlier, then this new bank can further check the details of the previous loan available to them, they can examine if the value of the collateral is sufficient for them to extend another loan given the existing liability on the property. So this made the system an integrated one wherein financial institutions, prospective lenders could know more about the borrower. I hope that I have made myself very clear on this topic. Now let's move back to the question after understanding the basic concept of what SIRSAI is. The first statement says SIRSAI has been established under Section 8 of the Companies Act 2013 by SEBI. So this is not correct because it has been established by 
the government of india we have got our answer that is option a but let's move and see the other options also second is major shareholders of sirsai are the central government of india nhb and public sector banks which is true third is sirsai was established to discourage and prevent the practice of taking out various loans from several banks using the same asset or the property so this is the objective that we have already discussed next is the scope of sirsai was extended to include the registration of any security interest that were created via the assignment of factoring or accounts receivable now if you are wondering that what factoring is then it is a financial transaction and a type of debt of finance in which a business sells its accounts receivable to a third party at a discount so sir size mandate was extended in the year 20 12 now let's move on to the next question and the last question for today the situation where exercising the call option provides gain to the option holder it is called as so four options have been given to you and you can recall it that you must have read call option in your financial management subject call option is basically the right to buy and a person takes the call option only when he can predict or he believes that in the future time the price of the underlying stock will be more than the strike price so as i have told you that buying a call option means that the option holder may or may not exercise this right to buy a specific quality at the strike price for example an investor has purchased a call option with a strike price of 1000 rupees and the premium he is paying on it is 100 rupees so this premium has to be paid whether he exercises the call option or not so you can say that this is a kind of fixed cost and when will he exercise this option only when the market value or the actual price of the stock is more than rupees Thousand because if the market value is one zero five zero also, then he realizes a profit of fifty, and his overall net effect will be premium outgo of minus hundred plus fifty. That is minus fifty. And if he wouldn't have exercised this option at one zero five zero, then his actual loss would have been. Hundred that is of premium, so he can basically offset the amount of premium by exercising the option even when the actual price is more than the strike price. And what is the break-even point here? Break-even point will be of strike price plus premium that is at eleven hundred. So if the market value is eleven hundred, then he realizes no profit, no loss situation. I hope that I have made myself clear on this part. So, if you want to understand this through a diagram, so this is the profit part, this is the loss part, and this is the market price of the underlying asset. Hundred, as I have told you, that is the premium that he is giving. This is thousand, the strike price, and this is the net payoff on call. This point is eleven hundred, and this is the Break even point. So this is this diagram is basically the payoff on the call option to the option holder. Similarly, you can find it for a payoff on call option to option writer, and this is the call option. You can similarly analyze it for the put option. So I hope that you must have understood this part because understanding one part will make you easily understand the other three parts also. Now coming back to the question. so it says that what is that call what is that situation call where it provides gain to the option holder so option holder gains only when the market price is more than the strike price so this situation is known as in the money so the answer is in the money at the money means when the market price is equals to the strike price and out of money means when market price is less than the strike price so our answer is in the money i hope that you have understood this concept very well because this is one of the very important and interesting topics in finance if you have any doubt regarding to 
any of the concept then do comment and ask your query so that we can answer your query in a much better way if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet then do subscribe to it for more regular updates thank you for watching the video